Welcome to the fifth episode of I'll Tell You What. If you're new in the pews, I'll Tell You What is a weekly deep dive into some of the most epic and memorable engagements, weddings, and marriages that have occurred throughout Black history. I'm Ashley, your favorite rock and toots that brings you these stories now every Monday. So in honor of Black Music Month, let's discuss one of the legends in jazz, Louis Armstrong. Well, first, did you know that Louis Armstrong is not Louis Armstrong? He's actually Louis Armstrong. I didn't know that. But apparently white people called him Louis and that's how we commonly know him. But he actually preferred Louis. So in honor of that, we're going to call him Louis Armstrong throughout the rest of this video. But one thing I'm pretty sure you didn't know that Louis Armstrong was known as a man that quote, didn't like to be alone. I didn't know that either. Louis was truly a very interesting man with very interesting relationships. You will soon see. It's time for us to walk down the aisle to reminisce on Louis and his four marriages. So before Louis Armstrong was the Louis Armstrong we knew, he was actually this young cornet player that worked at the Brick House, which was this club in Gretna, Louisiana. That's where he met Daisy Parker, this sex worker with hypnotizing eyes and thick thighs. Louis recalled this one night when he was just fiending to be with Daisy. I'm guessing this was like the first time that they would, you know, be intimate. So he rushed to her after work and when she got undressed, she took off her fake hips. You know, like those kind of BBLs you could purchase off Amazon? Right. So he said, quote, as much as I've been admiring this chick in her shape, here she comes bringing me a pair of water wings. But he got over it though. They started seeing each other and well, he became a regular customer. And soon he realized he was falling in love. But that was also around the time that he discovered she had a common law husband. So one time when Lewis went to Daisy's house in the middle of their foreplay, her husband came home. Lewis grabbed his hat and took off running while that man beat Daisy. Yeah. He convinced himself in that moment that he was not going to do this again. So a month later, Daisy went to his house and basically begged him to come back to her. Because if you can tell, this was no longer a client relationship anymore. She stopped charging him. They talked it over at a local hotel and made a decision. The very next day, on March 19th, 1918, Lewis and Daisy went to City Hall and got married. Lewis was about 16 and Daisy was about 19. So a marriage that was so obviously inspired by lust definitely had some major problems. One, his mother didn't approve. Two, they were unhoused initially. And three, and probably the biggest problem was that they were emotionally and physically abusive to each other. Lewis said that basically the way he had to quote get along with her was to quote beat the hell out of her every night and make love in order to get some sleep. So of course the chaos in this marriage basically pushed Lewis in the direction of other women. And when Daisy found out about it, because of course she would find out, she would threaten to kill him. Like this one time, Lewis said he woke up and Daisy had quote, had a big bread knife laying on his throat. But Lewis would continue to cheat on her anyway. One time at the funeral, one of his third ward friends, Black Benny, Daisy saw Lewis chatting with this girl that he was cheating on her with. And she immediately ran up on him and tried slashing his face with a razor. He ran away, but another friend that was also conversing with the two of them got caught in the crossfire as Daisy slashed his butt. And that wasn't enough. Daisy found bricks and started throwing them at Lewis. Lewis picked up a brick and threw it at Daisy and actually hit her in the stomach. Police came and actually ended up arresting her because she kicked the cop in the face. Mind you, all of this is happening while the funeral is going on. After it ended, Lewis went and got Daisy from the police station and they went home. By summer of 1918, Lewis was offered a job outside of New Orleans with the tutor that taught him how to read music, Fate Marabal. Since Daisy and Lewis weren't in a good place, he was kind of looking at this as a chance to have a fresh start. Now during his time away, she actually stopped her sex work and got a job being a maid for a white family. She also adopted a daughter, but the thing that was probably the biggest surprise was that Daisy had a boyfriend, a man called Shots, whose government name was also Lewis, 
and he also played the cornet, like a great value Lewis, if you will. In summer of 1922, Lewis was offered a job in Chicago. He was excited to be away from Daisy. Once he got settled up there, he would work with the pianist in King Oliver's band named Lil Hardin, or Hot Miss Lil, as she was known. You might have actually heard of her. She's kind of known to be kind of a unsung um, woman in jazz. Well, she was about three years older than Lewis and a little bit more established. Her first thoughts about this infamous little Lewis was that he was fat, he couldn't dress, and he had bangs. Like, what is this, honey? <laughs> so Lil was everything that Daisy wasn't. She was educated, a musician. She was someone that understood the man that Lewis was becoming. And she didn't need him to provide for her. Like, she made good money on her own, $100 a week. Lil was giving I-N-D-E-P-E-N-D-E-N-T. Do you know what that means? Okay. She also treated him as a mentee or a protege because she saw a lot of potential in his musical talent. She became his official stylist too because he really just dressed like a poor boy from New Orleans and people were making fun of him. Though there was an obvious power dynamic in their relationship, they confided in each other and eventually a romance developed. Now one thing they had in common was that they were both married previously. Well, Lewis was still married, but both of their marriages burned out really fast. Once he found newfound interest in Lil, he knew he needed to get a divorce immediately to be done with Daisy for good. He started the proceedings in fall of 1923, and two days before Christmas, the, the divorce was granted after six years of marriage. Now, six weeks later, on February 5th, 1924, the Chicago Defender announced that Lil and Lewis had gotten married. Let's take a short break before we discuss Lewis and Lil Armstrong, the two some would deem the first couple of jazz. <music> About six weeks after Louis Armstrong's divorce to his first wife, Daisy, he married his co-worker and fellow musician, Lil Hardin, on February 5th, 1924. And I have wedding details for you. She wore a white crepe gown from Paris with silver beads and rhinestones. Her bridesmaid was a childhood friend named Lucille Saunders. She wore an orchid chiffon gown with silver trimmings. And their wedding guests consisted of the bands that they were working with, plus her friends and family. After they got married, she found a house and put it in her name. She also moved her mother in as well. He moved his adopted son in with them. Yeah, I forgot to tell you, but he unofficially adopted his cousin's child when he was about 14. So sometime after Lil and Louis got married, Louis's mom, man, ran into his ex-wife Daisy. She told her she was still in love with him and she was going to get him back. Now once Lil and Lewis were married, her involvement in his professional career became way more apparent and their boss Joe Oliver did not like that at all. For one, Lil didn't like the way that Joe was managing Lewis's salary. Like Lewis never saw a dime because Joe kept it. And if he were to need any of the money that he earned, he would have to go to Joe for it. She took over Lewis's finances and apparently other members of the band realized that maybe they need to have more ownership into their salary as well. That caused them to leave, which again, didn't make Joe very happy. Lil inspired Lewis to quit because she felt like he needed to play first trumpet somewhere, meaning she wanted her man to be able to make a name for himself and not just be in someone else's shadow. She really believed in him and wanted more for him, sometimes more than he really wanted for himself. Lewis was hesitant, but he did leave the band. Now, Daisy tracked him down because she wasn't playing. She showed up one night when he was performing and he pulled her aside. She believed Lewis was still her husband and was going to pull out her razor if he said otherwise. Now, he reminded her that we're divorced, but she didn't want to hear that. And she would stay in Chicago for a little bit. Now, sometime later, Daisy actually got into a fight at a bar. She heard someone was talking junk about Lewis and she was like, that's my ex-husband. You're not about to talk about him any sort of way. And I believe that man likely called her a name and pulled out a knife. Well, then she pulls out her razor and they both start to slashing each other up. Daisy ended up in the hospital for about two weeks. And when she recovered, she promptly took herself back to New Orleans and Lewis would rarely see her ever again. Now, Lou's new job would take him to New York while Lil was in Chicago. And at that time, there were like two major clubs in New York. There was the Cotton Club and there was Connie's Inn. Now, the Cotton Club you've heard of used to be this club that was called Club Deluxe that was owned by boxer Jack Johnson. 
y'all remember him, right? At the time, it was a white only club, though there would obviously be non-white performers. Now, Kanye's Inn was actually more integrated and that's where Lewis worked. He met a chorus girl named Fanny Cotton that worked at the Cotton Club. Now, soon after they met, an affair began. Lewis found that he wasn't in love with her, but he did find comfort in their relationship. Like, there wasn't any pressure or demands, which was kind of the opposite to his marriage with Lil. And ultimately, he just hated being lonely more than anything. While his career would take him from New York to various clubs in New England, Fanny would meet him there. One time while there, Lewis asked Fanny to marry him if she stayed with him while he was traveling on the road. Meanwhile, whenever Lewis and Lil were apart, they would actually write each other. Now Lil, back in Chicago, felt like something might be going on with her husband. You know, women's intuition is like always right. So she took a train to see him. Upon arrival, she went to check his billing in the orchestra and was disappointed to find out that not only did he not have top billing, but he was barely even acknowledged in the credits. And in this ad for the orchestra, when he was acknowledged, they spelled his name wrong. Like, what was all of this for? So then she goes back to Chicago, goes to a manager she worked with in the past, and was like, I'm starting my own band, I'm gonna put my husband in it, and I want y'all to pay him $75 a week. Mind you, at the time, he was only making $55 a week. She wanted him to be billed as the world's greatest trumpet player. And though there was some back and forth between her and the manager, she eventually won. She told her husband, I got you a job, you can come home. And though Lewis was actually quite fine playing in New York and liked his entire setup there, especially with Fanny, he went home to Lil. He played with that band for a little while and the success actually led him to go on to play at the Vendome Theater at the end of 1925. It was there that he met a woman named Alpha Smith. Now Alpha was 19 and would come at least twice a week to sit in the front row and hear Lewis play. So naturally, it didn't take long for them to start singing each other because also around that time Lewis's dynamic with Lil was deteriorating. On paper they could have been seen as this musical power couple but Lil being so focused on his career and bossing him around is, is likely what drove them apart. Now by 1926 about two years into their marriage Lewis and Lil's romantic relationship was basically dead. He moved him and Clarence into Alpha's apartment with her mom and stepdad. Now with the extra money he started to make, he would shower Alpha with clothes and jewelry. But then he started to feel like she was taking advantage of his access to nicer things and aka having money. And at this time, he was actually still in touch with Fanny despite her being miles away. Despite all of that though, he didn't think it made sense to officially leave Lil, the woman that was basically the reason for his success. He really didn't know what to do. Now Lil wasn't going to give up easily though. When Lewis went to LA in May of 1930, for work, she went to visit. Lewis said that if there was any chance of rekindling their romance, it was dead when he discovered that not only did she have a boyfriend, but she brought him with her to LA. As a man that couldn't stay faithful if he tried, he was disappointed in Lil. Now, that disappointment didn't mean much because when he returned to Chicago 10 months later, he needed a place to stay. And frustrated with Alpha and her gold digging ways, he went to the place that was the closest to home, Lil's house. She said that by August of 1931, they were officially separated, but she would not grant him the divorce because she just didn't want to let him go. Lewis would continue to see Alpha, and when he went to perform in his hometown of New Orleans, he brought her with him. Unbeknownst to him, though, Lil and her boyfriend came too. They were staying at the same hotel. She came into his hotel one time when he was asleep and got into it with Alpha, took his car back to Chicago with a bellhop, not even the man she came with. In summer of 1932, his career took him to Europe while resting with Alpha because of course he brought her with him. Before his premiere, he got this knock on the door. It was Fanny. Caught off guard, he introduced her to his fiance. This made Alpha snap. That night before his performance, Alpha came into his dressing room and tried to choke him out. She was causing all this ruckus right before his performance, so he knocked her the mess out and went on stage. They made up, but Sis was jealous and refused to leave his side moving forward. Now, years of being unsatisfied in his marriage and his affair would go by as he continued to make strides in his career. And on September 30th, 1938, after a total of 14 years of marriage, where about 12 of those were not happy, Lil and Lewis officially divorced. The divorce decree 
said that he deserted her in 1931. Lil would never remarry, would keep his last name, and would continue to follow his career afterwards. I also read that they would remain friends. Now Lewis, however, would go on to marry Alpha less than two weeks after the divorce was finalized. Now let's take a quick break before I tell you all about Lewis and Alpha's marriage. Now, less than two weeks after Louis Armstrong's divorce to the wife that basically made him Louis Armstrong, on October 11, 1938, he married his mistress, Alpha. Now, they got married while he was on tour in Houston. And this felt more like an obligation than an actual marriage he was thrilled about because he was tired of her gold digging ways and that actually started a relationship with a woman named Polly Jones. Now, allegedly, he had promised Polly to marry her once the divorce was finalized, but he didn't. And because of that, the following years, she would actually try to sue him for $35,000, which today would be close to $750,000 because she said he breached the promise. I couldn't find any more information on that and Polly. So yeah. I suppose Lewis felt stuck in a sense. His marriage to Alpha kind of started chaotically, meaning it was somewhat reminiscent to his marriage to Daisy because when Alpha would start drinking, they would start to get into arguments and then Lewis would beat her. But around the time Lewis married Alpha, he actually met a dark-skinned woman with big eyes and a Coke bottle figure named Lucille Wilson. Her stage name was Brown Sugar and she was a chorus girl at the New Cotton Club. Lewis was in love with her skin tone, shape, and sensibilities. And basically, she was everything Alpha wasn't. So naturally, they started dating because you should know him at this point, right? So Alpha found out that he was basically running the city with Lucille and started to charge him $5 every time he came home late. And Lewis was just like, okay, I'm going to pay this $5 because I don't care and I am enjoying my time with this girl. In 1942, the marriage between Alpha and Lewis was a dead dead. He wasn't making as much money as he used to and she admitted that she didn't love him anymore but was actually in love with a drummer named Cliff Lemon. When the news came out that they broke up, Lewis wrote a letter to the reporter that broke the news airing all of Alpha's business out. Like Alpha was bragging that this new guy had paid her bills and Lewis was like I gave her thousands for clothes and jewelry like what is throwing you a couple dollars here and there compared to what I have done for you. He went to court on September 29th 1942 to get the divorce and by October 2nd it was granted and five days later Lucille and Lewis would get married because this man waits for nothing. All right so let's take one more very quick break and I will tell you about the last woman Lewis would ever marry, Lucille Armstrong. So five days after Louis Armstrong's divorce to his third ex-wife was granted, he turned around and married his mistress, Lucille. They got married after finally finding a minister to ordain their Catholic Baptist marriage. Now Lewis said, quote, when Lucille came along, I knew she was it, the right one. I think a man instinctively knows when he's got the right woman. They bought a house in the quiet suburbs of Corona, New York, which was a home that Lewis truly felt like was Lucille's, but also kind of his, as the home he shared with Lil never really felt like it was his home. When he wasn't working or on the road, he was known to throw the ball around with the local kids in the neighborhood as well as buy them ice cream. And he also frequented barber shops and other local spots like a true resident of the area. In a 1964 Ebony article, Lucille recalled him saying, quote, don't get rid of this place during my lifetime. In 1949, Time magazine would honor him by making him the first jazz musician to appear on the cover. He was in New Orleans around that time, performing with the All-Stars at a Mardi Gras gala. A woman showed up claiming to be Mrs. Armstrong trying to get in for free. Now, Lucille was already inside, so who in the world could this be? Who do you think it was? 
It was Daisy, his abusive first wife. She allegedly was still in love with him and considered herself to be his wife, though it had been 25 years since they divorced. But they let her in and I guess all was well. Now during Lewis's marriage to Lucille, he acquired an interesting hobby. He dabbled in reading and writing smut. Yes, he was very proud of this and even wanted his friends to read it aloud. Now this embarrassed Lucille and she was simply not amused by this type of stuff at all. But in the 1950s, Lewis would meet a girl named Lucille Sweetie or Sweets Preston. She was a dancer at the Cotton Club and you know where this is headed. They began an affair. In November 1955, she told Lewis that she was pregnant. Now some of his friends doubted if this was actually his child. Now when on tour, he would write sweets and the letters would show his excitement about their child. In one letter, he said that, quote, if I ever get rid of that evil selfish bee, whether you want me or not, you will have to marry me. I pray to God every day for that moment, your future husband. Now, allegedly, he tried telling Lucille that this child was his and would she want to adopt the baby? She couldn't believe it. She said, quote, who told you you got a baby by sweetie? You better not bring no baby around here. You couldn't make a baby with a pencil. You sure are stupid. But he felt like this was his kid though. Like he would visit, he would send money to sweets and their child, which was a daughter named Sharon. And he would also claim that if he passed away, their child would be taken care of. He also bought them a three bedroom home in Mount Vernon, New York. Now, Lewis and Sweet's relationship would continue on through about 1967-1968. Sweets and Sharon would accompany Lewis to Atlantic City because he was performing there. And while there, Sweets and Lewis got into an argument. She wanted to know when was he going to leave Lucille so they could get married. And Lewis screamed, never. And that would basically end their relationship. About four years later, on July 6, 1971, just about a month before he turned 70, Louis Armstrong passed away. He left everything to Lucille and his estate was estimated to be valued around $530,775, which would be around $4 million today. Now, she would receive about $73,000 a year in royalties. He also left his sister $5,000 as well as his adopted son, Clarence. Now, the child he considered his daughter, Sharon, did not receive a single penny. And after Louis died, Lucille signed an affidavit claiming that he didn't have any biological children. So about six weeks after Lewis died, on August 28th, there was a memorial concert for him. His ex-wife, Lil Armstrong, along with some of his friends, put this concert together. At the time, Lil was 73 years old. She was performing the St. Louis Blues when she collapsed on stage. She was rushed to the hospital, but passed away. Lil essentially died honoring the man she helped mold into the musician we all know. Life is truly poetic if you think about it. Now, over a decade later, in October 1983, while in Boston for a fundraising concert in Lewis's name, Lucille had a seizure and died at the age of 69. And that, my friends, concludes the story of the many, many marriages of Louis Armstrong. If you want to learn more about Louis and his life, I suggest you read Louis Armstrong, An Extravagant Life by Lawrence Burgreen, Louis Armstrong, An American Genius by James Lincoln Collier, Lil Satchmo, Living in the Shadow of My Father, Louis Daniel Armstrong by Sharon Preston Falta. Or you could watch Little Satchmo, a documentary based off her memoir. The links to these pieces and the others I read in my research will be included in the notes below. And this is something I'll start to include on every episode. promised it's time for show notes a chance for us to share our wedding moments with the all runner family and to start i'll share a photo from my wedding in 2020 because we were a pandemic couple we got married in our living room our officiant was my childhood pastor aaron rushing and our photographer that captured this beautiful photo is kaya Cretenden of kaya c photography if you love fine art photography you should definitely check her out my wedding planner because yes i had a wedding planner even though i got married in my living room it's courtney jackson of the charming details highly recommend her but all runners i want to see your wedding moments too 
You can show off your wedding moments by completing the form in the notes below. All right, Owl Runners, just a few housekeeping notes here. If you missed the news, new episodes of I'll Tell You What will be dropping every Monday on the tube of you and wherever you get your podcast. In addition to that, and also don't forget to subscribe and follow us everywhere you can and grab something from the I'll Tell You What Etsy to help support the show. You like this shirt? Yeah you can get one just like this. Anyway, the links to do so are in the notes below. And you're definitely going to want to follow us this week because we will be having our first giveaway. Uh-huh. Outside of that, if you want to make a request, you want to advertise with us, you want to chat, hit me up at aisle at huidu.com. That is A-I-S-L-E-H-U-E-I-D-O dot com. And if you want to follow me, you can do so by finding me at Demi Tosh on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. That is D-E-M-I-T-A-S-H-E. All right, y'all. So... This was a great episode. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think as always. And I will see y'all next week. We will be highlighting some very epic and memorable interracial marriages that have occurred throughout Black history. You will definitely enjoy that episode. Trust me. Have a great one. See y'all in the pews.